Sand Creek Massacre was perhaps one of the most unfortunate events in the history of uh, U.S. Indigenous peoples relations. It occurred in southeastern Colorado, November 29th of 1864, in which a village of Cheyenne, primarily Cheyenne but also Arapaho peoples, was attacked by a force of Colorado militia under the command of Colonel John Chivington. A number of Indigenous peoples were killed and then perhaps the worst part of the massacre was that uh, in the Throughout the course of the day, the bodies were profaned in, uh, in various ways and mutilated uh, and is not perhaps one of the, uh, the brightest chapters in Colorado history. It was a very significant episode in national history as it marked a shift or a turning point uh, in the history of relations between uh, the United States and the indigenous peoples. My argument is that religion or religious ideals had a very strong uh, influence both amongst the leadership as well as amongst the rank and file of the individual men of the 3rd Colorado Cavalry. One of the striking things about the Sand Creek Massacre is the level of religious involvement that so many of the leaders, uh, especially within the Colorado Cavalry, uh, had uh, with the Methodist Church and with other churches within the territory as well. Uh, John Shivington, the colonel uh, who's in charge of the, the Colorado forces, uh, is a presiding elder of the Rocky Mountain District and a, a practicing minister for many years. Uh, John Evans, uh, who was the governor at the time, uh, was raised a Quaker but converted to Methodism uh, fairly early in life, uh, was instrumental in founding one Methodist university uh, just outside of Chicago, Northwestern University, in a town that is now named for him in Evanston, Illinois, and then also is a founder of uh, Denver University uh, up in Denver, which also has uh, an affiliation uh, with the Methodist Church. And Evans remains a, an active uh, both philanthropist as well as a, a director uh, in Methodist affairs throughout his career, partially as a result of the Sand Creek Massacre, um, asked to resign uh, from his duties as governor, but remains in the territory and is very active in, in affairs in Denver and investments in, in a variety of uh, different different business pursuits and so for me it's striking how uh, so many individuals uh, who are, are intimately associated with this event um, have such strong religious leanings that uh, that they are um, either cultivating or certainly not ashamed of and, and uh, uh, perhaps more so than, than other episodes or other incidences uh, within this period uh, it's, it's, it's easy to see and easy to make these connections in this particular event. Coffin and Halbert were two participants uh, in the event, members of the Colorado Cavalry, who came to sort of different conclusions later in life uh, about the event. Both are uh, probably two of the principal authors in terms of published memoirs uh, about their experiences and their remembrances about the event. Uh, Coffin was from Boulder County uh, in the area up near Longmont, and uh, later in life, uh, Coffin's views on the massacre, uh, while he was present at the massacre, he, he felt very strongly against the atrocities and, and in his uh, earliest remembrances published uh, 15 years after the event, um, mentioned how that had a powerful effect on him and that he had uh, you know, attempted unsuccessfully to argue against uh, some of the, uh, the depredations and mutilations that had occurred. Later in life, uh, a Coffin, uh, according to the research I've uncovered, it becomes uh, uh, an avowed free thinker and, uh, and follows sort of on that path. Uh, whereas Irving Halbert, who was a, a resident, a lifelong resident of Colorado Springs, has an elementary school named for him over on the west side of town, uh, is one of the staunchest defenders uh, of the Sand Creek Massacre and, and sort of uh, adheres to those views. And it's, I think, of significance that Halbert's father uh, was a Methodist minister and, and aligned very closely with John Chivington, who was also not only a minister, um, but the presiding elder uh, of, uh, of the Methodist Church in, uh, in the Colorado Territory. And so my argument is that the religious motivations or religious backgrounds of these two individuals not only shape their actions at the massacre but the perceptions and the ways that we interpret the event uh, in the years afterwards. The central question which is how could seemingly ordinary everyday people come to this level uh, of behavior and, and action and arguably this is a well certainly this is a, a, a question I think that has contemporary relevance. We. Um, here uh, not infrequently about uh, relationships between religious indoctrination and, and the appropriate levels of that within the, uh, the armed forces today, uh, as well as uh, obviously we still have had recent episodes of uh, unfortunate acts uh, by service members of uh, various nationalities, including the United States. Uh, against civilians in, uh, in countries where we are uh, in conflict. And so uh, understanding that, uh, preventing that, uh, I think it has both a, uh, a, a historical spec uh, perspective, but also hopefully some use uh, as well. The beauty of the site or the drive out to the site, that's sort of the first impression that you get. But when you actually get to the site itself, when you get to the overlook, um, 
it's very powerful emotionally to know that you're at the site now uh, where so many people lost their lives and in, in such a horrific fashion. You do get an overwhelming sense that in, that in many ways there's something, something left uh, of what happened and that, and that you are on holy ground. You're at a place where something of, of great significance happened uh, and a place where, uh, where people lost their lives and uh, um, deserves commemoration and certainly deserves remembrance.